When I started the investigation, I'd become a superintendent and posted to the murder squad. I'd made it. And then I went in to see the assistant commissioner, and he said to me, uh, congratulations. Now, Mr. Reed, he said, I want you to do the craze. Hello and welcome to another video. In this one we are going to look at the life of Leonard Nipper Reed and his involvement investigating the Cray twins. I won't go too in depth on the early years of Nipper. I will just give you a brief outline of his younger years coming up and then we will get to the stuff concerning the Crays. Nipper was born in 1925 in Nottingham. He was one of four children and Nipper was the third born. He had two older sisters, Ida and May, and a younger brother called Eric. Nipper left school at 14, and on leaving school, he worked in a tobacco factory, feeding raw tobacco leaves into a machine. He was there for two years until he was called up for the Navy and posted to HMS Ganges, the naval training base at Harwich. Nipper was demobbed in 1946 with the rank of Petty Officer. Nipper's next step was to get a job as his father had been nagging him to get one. He had two choices, go back into the Navy or join in the police force. Nipper chose the latter. Nipper didn't hold out much hope for being a policeman as he was very short. He couldn't join the Nottinghamshire Police Force as there was a minimum six foot requirement for all officers. So he, he opted for the Metropolitan Police in London, whose height requirement was four inches shorter. In 1947, Nipper came to London as a police probationer. In 1958, Nipper was promoted to detective sergeant. In 1963, Nipper was part of a large team from Scotland Yard that investigated the Great Train Robbery in Buckinghamshire. Nipper's first job was to organise the control room, but he was eager to get out and about in the investigation, which he did, visiting the robber's hideaway at Leverslade Farm. In 1964, Nipper was given the task of investigating the Cray firm. By this point, the twins were very well known in criminal and police circles. This was also the year of the Peer and the Gangster Inquiry, where Ronnie Cray was reported to be in the company of Robert Lord Boothby, a prominent ex-conservative politician who had somewhat of a small celebrity status, appearing on television and radio programmes at the time and throughout the 1960s. Chief Superintendent Fred Gerrard, gave Nipper the job to get the craze. His words were, I want you to get a little team together and have a go at the craze. Back in those days, lots of villains got away with a lot of stuff. We're talking big villains in the game, not small ones. The police had an attitude of villains being too big to arrest. So people like the craze got away with a lot. The craze had been taken on by the police in the past, but not really concentrated on. So by 1964, the twins were pretty much free to do as they pleased without much worry from the police, as in any big investigations. If the police are persistent enough, the police will usually find someone who will give evidence, even if he doesn't particularly want to, but nobody did with the craze. Like most big villains in those days, the twins did have a few police in their pocket from Scotland Yard. That is to say that they possibly gave over a few quid to some police officers or they may have even given up some names of villains of lesser status to keep the police officers happy. Although this goes against the code that villains live by, so they say, which amongst other things was a definite rule of no grassing whatsoever. This was grassing for all intents and purposes and it seemed to be a widespread thing that happened. 
Charlie Richardson was also said to do business with the police this way. If we didn't pay these people money, my customers had all kind of harassment. My premises were searched. And I mean, it's a strong form of black belt and it had to be paid. Everybody else paid the police off, every other metal merchant. If I didn't pay them off, I'd have been in a very vulnerable position. How much would you pay off in a year? Well, I've, I've never really thought about it, really, but I suppose it went into thousands of pounds. Thousands of pounds? Yes, I would say so. To everybody, really. People who finished up right at the top of the scale, commanders at Scotland Yard. Nippery's investigation started with him wanting to actually see what the twins looked like, and his first port of call was the twins' local pub that they favoured at the time, called the Grave Maurice. Nipper Reed had heard that Ronnie Cray had arranged to meet a TV interviewer called Michael Barrett. Nipper arrived at the Grave Maurice in tatty old clothes, a cloth cap and a copy of the evening news. Nipper got a sandwich and a drink and began to wait. Ronnie came within half an hour in a large American car. First a man named Duke Osborne got out, his hand in his jacket pocket so it seemed as though he was carrying a gun. He looked up and down the road came into the pub and gave the place a quick look over to see who was about. Then he went back out onto the pavement and gave a nod in the direction of the car. Through the pub's open door, Nipper saw Ronnie Cray unfold himself on the back seat, straighten himself up and hurry across the pavement and into the pub. It was a summer's evening and I realised that a car had drawn up immediately outside the door and looked outside. It's a big American type car and a guy stepped out of the car, put with his hand in his pocket, as, as though he had a gun in his pocket, and he sort of swept the street, looking up and down, and making sure that there was no one in sight, and then gave a signal, and the back door opened, and out stepped Ronnie Cray. And I was amazed, because he was dressed for all the world, like a 1930s Chicago gangster. He had a long, long cashmere coat that reached to his ankles, tied in a loose uh, belt at the waist. Uh, his hair was greased and, and parted, and, and he, he, he swept across the pavement and into the pub. Nipper Reed said once Ronnie was inside the Grave Maurice, the Minders selected two booths, and Ronnie sat in one whilst the Minders collected two gins and a whiskey from the bar. Ronnie remained in solitary splendour with his men in the next booth until Barra arrived, he was wearing a neck brace at the time and the minders did everything but frisk him. He was escorted by them to Ronnie's table before they went back to collect his drink. At the end of the interview, Osborne and the others went out, swept the street and then Ronnie hurried into the car. This charade didn't impress Nipper, he found it unnecessary and silly and it was all just for show. It's no secret that Al Capone was one of Ronnie Cray's many heroes, so this behaviour for him would not be unusual. At this stage, the twins didn't really have any enemies that would threaten their life, so Duke Osborne combing the pub and the street before Ronnie's entrance was probably a bit over the top. Duke Osborne was soon after this incident caught with guns under his bed in his lodgings. So the stance of a gun in his pocket that day outside the Grave Maurice was probably a gun in his pocket. After the Grave Maurice visit, Nipper went to see old Cray friend and now defunct gangster Jack Spot Coma to see if he could get some information about the Cray firm. Jack Spot had nothing to give Nipper, but he did tell him that he did try to teach the twins how to get plenty of money without the violence, but they wouldn't listen. Nipper then took on the lead that there was protection money being paid by an Italian restaurant in the British Museum in Store Street, but the owner denied the rumour and this line of inquiry was abandoned after observation failed to identify anyone remotely connected to the craze. Nipper found at the time there were stories circulating that the craze had slashed the buttocks of people who refused to be intimidated and pay protection money and that a court was set up in which a person was always found guilty. It was said that Ronnie Cray's favourite sentence was the buttock slashing with a razor, so that every time he sits down, he'll remember us. This seems to be kind of like how the Richardsons were supposed to be doing business over the other side of the water in South London, so it could be 
that some of the information is getting a bit mixed up. Although buttock slashing in some form was probably done by Ronnie, I don't know if it would be in a kangaroo court setup. Nipper did visit hospitals in the Bethnal Green area to see if anyone had been admitted with any such wounds but to no avail. Any such victims would not have ended up in a general hospital anyway, seeing as the firm could call on the services of their tame doctor, Dr Blasker, based in Manchester Road on the Isle of Dogs. Dr Blasker would do most things the twins would have asked. Not to be deterred, Nipper sought out former Cray friend David Litvinoff. David Litvinoff had recently been slashed across the face after falling out with Ronnie Cray, but it was never truly established who the assailant was. David Litvinoff has featured in some of my other videos, so I won't go into any detail about him here. But Nipper saw Litvinoff at the Colton Towers bar in Chelsea. At the meeting, Litvinoff said he had no intention of making any written statement or assisting in any prosecution, maintaining that although he had been attacked, he could not identify his attackers. This was very wise of David Litvinoff, as he would have witnessed firsthand the violence that the twins were capable of. I'm sure a slashed face was more than enough for David Litvinoff. Nipper's inquiry into the twins and the firm was not really going too well and he did observe the twins openly, even outside their house. This was portrayed in the film Legend at the start when Reggie brings Nipper a cup of tea. Nipper did eventually get a few leads about the firm's income from long firm frauds and he did close down some of these and convict some people. But as far as getting at the twins, it was all a bit of a failure. The inquiry had ran for six months and it was time to wind it down. This is the first time that Nipper encountered what was called the wall of silence around the twins. The shutting down of some of the long firm frauds had inconvenienced the twins but nothing other than that. Just as this all ended, Nipper got a stroke of luck in January 1965 when information came in about a man called Hugh McCowan who had a problem with the craze wanting protection money from his club called The Hideaway in Soho. I have done a full video on The Hideaway so I won't really detail what went on here even though it don't feel right skipping it. The twins and Cray firm member Teddy Smith were arrested for this. At the time the twins were holed up in the Glen Ray Hotel. It was a place owned by Phoebe Woods. The twins and the firm kind of took over the place gradually it was their main base of operations around this time in 1965. The arrests went quietly at the Glen Ray. Reggie asked if he could say goodnight to his girlfriend Frances but he was not allowed. Ronnie was found with a sheath knife in his pocket and seemed too overwhelmed to reply to the arrest. At Highbury Vale Police Station the twins were charged with demanding money with menaces. Ronnie Cray replied, It's taken you long enough. This has all been in the mirror mirror meaning the daily mirror I assume. He then asked who had nicked them and when Nipper told him it was Superintendent Gerard, he asked again, yes but I mean who's it down to? Somebody must have put the finger on us. We haven't been out blacking people you know. Reggie then added, what's this man got the needle with us for? This definitely is not our game. As we know, despite the jubilation of Nipper finally getting the twins, it wasn't long lived as by April 1965, the twins and Teddy Smith were acquitted of all charges of demanding money with menaces. The case kind of fell into Nipper's lap when Hugh McCowan came forward about the twins demanding protection money. After a long six months of getting nowhere with his investigation, Lady Luck had shined on Nipper, so I suppose you could say it was easy come easy go for Nipper. The twins would later take over the hideaway club from Hugh McCowan and rename it the El Morocco. The opening night was lavish and it was two fingers up at the police. Nipper attended the club that night to make a note of the comings and goings. At first he posted himself up in a telephone box opposite the club with his notepad but he was spotted by a private detective called George Devlin who had been hired by the twins for the hideaway case. Devlin asked Nipper what he was doing and Nipper said he was ringing home to say he would be late. By Nipper's account it was a feeble excuse. With that George Devlin said rubbish, I know what you're doing, 
If you want to see who's here, why don't you come inside? It's no problem. Nipper, although a bit hesitant, decided to take up this offer, so he went into the club. According to Nipper, Ronnie Cray was furious, while it didn't seem to be bothering Reggie that Nipper was there. It was said that a picture was taken of Nipper with the twins on this night, and I think it's even depicted in the film Legend. But this is not true. The photograph was actually of Edmund Purdom, and the picture was printed in the Daily Express as Nipper Reed. This is just another one of the myths that surrounds the craze. After this failed attempt to get the twins off the streets in the East End, Fred Gerard told Nipper Reed he thought he deserved the rest and said he had put his name forward for a new six months middle management course known as the Intermediate Command Course at Brams Hill. On the 9th of March 1966, Nipper was promoted to Detective Chief Inspector it was the same day that Ronnie Cray strode into the Blind Beggar pub and shot rival villain George Cornell, who would later die of his injuries. The following year, Nipper would be promoted to superintendent. During the time between the Cray investigations, Nipper Reed was quietly at work on his other cases, with the most notable being the disappearance of gangster John Buggy in 1967. His body was later found by two off-duty police officers, when John Buggy's body surfaced from the water, the bound and bullet riddled body was found in the sea at Seaford in Sussex. Buggy had been wearing a black polo neck sweater and his arms had been bound with bailing wire. He had also been gagged. In his back pocket was his driving license. An examination by pathologist Francis Camps showed he had been shot twice. The murderers of John Buggy have never been brought to justice. At the time, the police believed that he may have been a banker for the great train robbers. It was said that he had spent money entrusted to him and this may have been a motive for his untimely death. There has been rumours that Buggy's death could have been the work of a very famous South London villain who had ties to the Cray firm, who was suspected of disposing of bodies in a similar fashion out at sea. But that is just rumours with no evidence of it being true. Nipper's jubilation on being made superintendent posted to the murder squad was short-lived when towards the end of 1967 he was told by the assistant commissioner Peter Brody uh, Congratulations. Now Mr Reed, he said, I want you to do the craze. This wasn't music to Nipper Reed's ears. Two years on from the frustrations of the first Cray investigation, he certainly would not be looking forward to a second one. I have heard that there was a third Cray investigation but I don't have any information on that. I don't know if it was before the hideaway investigation or in between the hideaway one and the final investigation. Nipper Reed's team on this new investigation would be based at Tintagel House on the Albert Embankment beside the River Thames. The investigation could not be risked being based at Scotland Yard due to the amount of corruption in the police force at the time. Like most villains from that era and after into the 1970s, information from the police could easily be brought by villains. A few brown envelopes would change hands. This is what caused the so-called wall of silence that surrounded the Cray firm. If somebody informed on the twins, the twins could potentially know about this before the person that had informed had even left the police station. By this time in 1967, the fear surrounding the craze was at its peak, with two murders under their belt and a significant hand in a third. The fear of the twins and the firm was great. Nobody was safe from the potential wrath of the twins. Ronnie Cray by this time was extremely ill with his mental health and Reggie, who was grieving from his wife's death in June that year, was just as volatile as Ronnie. The wrong word to either twin could command a bashing or worse. Even members of the firm were taking precautions to try and keep themselves safe from the twins' madness and paranoia. This wall of silence that was built up was justified. It would be more than your life's worth to say anything about the twins to the police, now more so than at any time in the firm's existence, as the twins had now had a taste for murder, and especially Ronnie Cray. Despite paranoia being rife in the firm, the twins at this time didn't really have any enemies that were a threat to them. 
The Richardsons were all in prison, so any threat from them was extinguished a long time ago. There was always the ever-present threat of arrest, but it had been well over a year since the very public shooting of George Cornell in the Blind Beggar pub, and at this stage it seemed as if Ronnie had literally got away with murder. The twins and Ian Barry were arrested for the George Cornell shooting in 1966, but they were released with no charges. When Nipper took his first look at the Cray files for this new investigation, he was surprised to see that nothing much had been added to it since his last investigation at the end of 1964 and the start of 1965. The only thing of note was a meeting with somebody behind the stands at Hackney Dog Track about the killing of George Cornell. This we can assume would have been Bobby Teal. Nipper decided to start this new investigation with people who were in the craze circle but had now managed to leave it and he found 32 people that had been involved with the firm but had now left. One of these was firm member Billy Exley. Nipper had no luck with Billy at first. Billy clammed up when asked about the twins and the firm but he did say he kept a shotgun behind the door in case trouble from the firm turned up. Billy Exley was ill at this stage with a bad heart. Nipper did go back to see Exley a few more times and Billy did eventually begin to talk. Nipper then had meetings with Leslie Payne. Payne dealt with most of the financial side of the things of the firm, mainly frauds and the taking over of clubs and businesses. Payne eventually provided a wealth of information to Nipper Reed. Leslie Payne had nothing to lose really. He was on Ronnie Cray's list of people that Ronnie kept that he wanted murdered and Payne was probably at the top of it. An attempt, if you want to call it that, was made to kill Leslie Payne at his home in Tulse Hill. The twins sent off Jack McVitie and Billy Exley for this job. The plan was to shoot Payne when he answered his front door. His wife answered the door that day and said he wasn't in. Exley and McVitie then left with Jack McVitie keeping the money that he was given to complete the job. This hastened the demise of Jack McVitie at the hands of the twins. I say hastened as Jack had done a few things wrong in the lead up to his death. In early 1968, the day that Nipper Reed had got immunity from prosecution for Leslie Payne for his cooperation with the police, Sylvia McVitie, together with a woman friend, walked into New Scotland Yard to report the fact that her old man, Jack McVitie, had been missing since the end of October. She had been in the previous November to West Ham Police Station, but the inquiry had not really got off the ground, principally because she was not able to give any definite information as to where he might have been killed. But on 8th of March 1968, Nipper did get some leads on what happened to Jack McVitie, when a woman come forward. She was a very knowledgeable lady who effectively pinpointed the site of the McVitie murder. She told Nipper Reed that the killing had taken place at a party in a basement flat in Everin Road. She wasn't sure of the number, but said it was owned by a blonde woman with two small children. This was enough for Nipper Reed to go on and send some officers out to canvas the area, posing as market researchers. It wasn't long before he had the information he needed. A blonde woman called Carol Skinner with two children living in a basement flat at 97 Everin Road. The crate investigation was going well but there was nothing to make a big breakthrough for arrests to be made. In early April 1968 the breakthrough in the investigation came though. It involved a man called Alan Bruce Cooper and another man called Paul Elvey. Through a wiretap, Nipper learned of a plot to bring explosives from Glasgow to London for the twins to use to blow up a man called George Karuna. This was a plan devised by Alan Bruce Cooper, who had been instructed to set it up as a test to his loyalty to the twins. Under questioning, Alan Bruce Cooper also spilled the beans on a crossbow and the infamous cyanide briefcase, which were both involved in other plots to kill. The cyanide briefcase was going to be used on villain Jimmy Evans at the Old Bailey where he would be turning up for a court case. The killing of Jimmy Evans would have been a favour 
by the twins to create associate and very heavy South London villain Freddie Foreman. Jimmy Evans and Ginger Marks shot Freddie Foreman's brother George on his doorstep due to an affair George Foreman was having with Jimmy Evans' wife. Evans and Ginger Marks were later shot in Cheshire Street in Bethnal Green with Ginger Marks disappearing, never to be found and presumed dead. Freddie Foreman was acquitted of the murder of Ginger Marks but later admitted it in his book Respect and later in TV interviews. As well as the plots to kill by crossbow, cyanide briefcase and explosives, Alan Bruce Cooper also talked about stolen bearer bonds and counterfeit currency that the twins were involved in. This was between the New York Mafia and the craze with a middleman called Joey Kaufman. Kaufman was due to arrive in London to discuss business with Alan Bruce Cooper. As Alan Bruce Cooper was supposed to be still in daily contact with the twins, Nipper didn't want anyone from the Cray side to be suspicious about his absence, so he arranged for Bruce Cooper to be admitted to a Harley Street clinic for treatment for a stomach ulcer. When Bruce Cooper phoned Ronnie and told him what had happened, there was an abundance of sympathy, but Ronnie regretted that after a trip to the country for the weekend, they were too tired to visit him. Instead, they would send firm member Tommy Cowley with some nice eggs. Obviously, the police had Bruce Cooper's room rigged with microphones, whilst Nipper sat next door with the receivers and a tape recorder. The twins later said they knew it was a trap, hence why they sent firm member Tommy Cowley along in their absence. Tommy Cowley said nothing incriminating during the visit. Just as Nipper and his team were about to leave, they had a stroke of luck with Joey Kaufman turning up and their conversations between Bruce Cooper and Kaufman became invaluable evidence as they discussed the bearer bonds and the counterfeit money. At this point, Nipper Reed had heard enough and decided to make a move on the twins and the firm. Things were getting too dangerous with the threat of explosives amongst other things on the streets of London. On the 7th of May 1968, Nipper called a pre-arrest briefing. At 6am sharp, each team was to enter the premises at Flat 43, Bunhill Row, Shoreditch and arrest the occupants. Tell them briefly the reasons they were being arrested and to make a thorough search of the property. When they left, an officer was to remain on the premises to ensure there could be no communication with any members of the firm who had avoided capture. All those arrested were to be brought to West End Central Police Station. The Craze and the firm had been out at the Astor Club the night before their arrests. They started in their favourite local pub at the time, the Old Horns, and then they moved on to the West End. Author John Pearson was in tow that evening. He had been seeing the twins and the firm on and off since the end of 1967 for research for his book he was going to write about the twins. The night ended in the early hours of the morning with the twins going back to their mother's flat at Braithwaite House. Charlie Cray Sr. and his wife Violet were away at the Brooks, a house in the Suffolk countryside the twins had recently acquired. At dawn on May the 8th, 1968, a team of detectives arrived at the new Sky Tower block in Clerkenwell where the Cray family had now moved. They jammed the lift walked up the stone steps to the ninth floor and jammed their way into flat 43. The first port of call was the living room where they found a 22 year old man called John Lucy sleeping on the sofa who was awoke by the invasion. Moving to the bedrooms, Nipper found Reggie in bed with a young woman called June MacDonald and Ronnie in bed with a 16 year old called Martin Morgan. I do believe that Martin Morgan was the son of the twins old friend Dickie Morgan. All were arrested by Nipper and led downstairs. Joey Kaufman, who had also been on a night out with the twins, was arrested at the Mayfair Hotel, a stone's throw from the Aston nightclub. The first person on Nipper's list that day to be interviewed when the twins and some of the firm were safely tucked up in their prison cells was blonde Carol Skinner from 97 Everin Road. She was brought to see Nipper at West End Central Police Station. She denied all knowledge of the craze and was emphatic that her flat had never been used for any criminal purposes whatsoever. Despite telling her the craze were now under lock and key, she never offered anything else. People were not silly, 
The twins have been arrested many times before and had always been released. Why would this time be any different? Eventually lots of witnesses to the twins crimes would all come forward including Carol Skinner. The barmaid of the blind beggar where George Cornell was shot would come forward and people like Lenny Hamilton would also give statements. The most surprising of the people that cooperated with Nipper were the ex-friends and firm members, people like Limehouse Willie who had been a good friend of the Cray family for many years. Billy Exley, Albert Donahue, Scotch Jack Dixon were all trusted members of the firm who all came on the side of law and order. The twins' own cousin, Ronnie Hart, even made a statement and told the grim tale of the murder of firm member Jack McVitie in all its grisly detail. I have done a video on the main Cray trial which is on the channel so I won't dwell on it here too much. As we know the twins got life with a recommended 30 years each. The second Cray trial for the Mitchell murder didn't go so well for Nipper. On Friday the 16th of May 1969 at 10.40am the jury retired to consider their verdicts on Ronnie, Reggie, Charlie Cray and Freddie Foreman. They were back in an hour and a half to ask a question and then came back again at half past three in the afternoon when they were told to try a little while longer to reach a unanimous verdict. When the jury returned they reached the verdict of guilty on the first count that Reggie Cray had conspired to that effect the escape of Frank Mitchell but so far as all the others were concerned the jury returned verdicts of not guilty. This second trial for Frank Mitchell hurt Nipper Reed. The jury had to rely on the evidence of firm member Albert Donahue and they just didn't believe him. Nipper did believe Albert Donahue and wanted some justice for Frank Mitchell but it was not to be. As we know now Albert Donahue's evidence was the truth of what happened to Frank Mitchell. The only part nobody is sure on is if Albert Donahue knew that he was leading Frank Mitchell to his death when he left Lenny Dunn's flat with him on that Christmas Eve evening in 1966. After the trials had finished and the Cray firm were under lock and key for many years in the instance of the twins for all of their lives Nipper was invited back to Scotland Yard for celebratory drinks where he was told he would be the next person to be promoted to commander in the CID and he was to be sent to Brams Hill on the 7th senior command course. Nipper also attended the appeals of the twins, Connie Whitehead, the Lambrianos, Ronnie Bender, Freddie Foreman and Ian Barry which were heard in the High Court in the Strand in July 1969. There were numerous grounds of appeal lodged but the two main ones boiled down to the refusal by Malford Stevenson to allow separate trials for the murders of Cornell and McVitie. Although the appeals lasted six days, Lord Widgery, the Lord Chief Justice, made short work of them in the court's decision given on July the 22nd, 1969. As to the first ground, he said, These two cases exhibit unusual features in common. Each was committed in cold blood and without obvious motivation. Each bore the stamp of a gang leader asserting his authority by killing in the presence of witnesses whose silence could be assured by that authority. Neither murder could be committed except on the basis that the members of the firm would rally round and clean up traces and secure the silence of those who may be inclined to give the offenders away. All these factors make it important and desirable in the public interest for these two unusual cases to be tried together. Also the interest of the press in this affair was so great that if the two murders had been tried separately the publicity attending the first trial would have made a fair trial on the remaining charge impossible. All the appeals failed. Nipper Reed later left Scotland Yard and had a spell up in his hometown of Nottingham before heading back to London and was based again at Tintangel House before retiring from the police force at the age of 52. After hopes of a job 
as a chief president at a casino in the Bahamas fell through. Nipper was security advisor to the National Museums and Galleries. Nipper was also on the British Boxing Board of Control as a member of the Southern Area Council. It was here when he was on the Boxing Board of Control that he encountered a Cray Firm associate, Mickey Fawcett, when Mickey was trying to get a boxing manager's licence. Mickey Fawcett was arrested in the mop-up of the Cray Firm in 1968. He was later released during the committal proceedings at Bow Street Magistrates Court. Mickey Fawcett that day was denied a boxing manager's licence due to knowing the craze. Mickey Fawcett said of this incident, Reed had seen me acquitted in the craze case and walk out a free man. Now it looked as if he had finally got his revenge. In Nipper's later years, he featured in a few Cray documentaries and gave other interviews on television and radio. And in 1991, he wrote a book alongside author James Morton entitled Nipper, The Man Who Nicked the Craze, where most of the information for this video is from. Nipper Reed passed away on the 7th of April 2020 due to complications from COVID-19. Having caught the virus in hospital where he was being treated for a foot infection, he passed away one week after his 95th birthday. Despite Nipper Reed being involved in many high profile cases, including the Great Train Robbery, Nipper's name will always be entwined with the brothers Cray. Bringing down the Cray firm was Nipper's greatest achievement in the police force. He had a bit of luck in places to help him nail the craze in 1968, but his sheer determination to see the job through cannot be underestimated. I hope you have enjoyed this little look at Nipper Reed, the man who brought down the Cray firm in 1968. I have missed some things out, like going in depth on the trial and the hideaway, but that's only because I've made videos on them already, so I didn't really want to go through all the details of them again. And I'm sure this video is long enough as it is. So that's about it for now. I would like to thank you all for watching. And I will see you again in the next video. Thank you.